Hello and welcome to the third part of my How to Fly the Spitfire Mark 9 series. Today we take a look on how to manage the engine of the Spitfire Mark 9. I will talk about engine management, fuel consumption, engine timers and so on. This video will be quite data driven, so I will show you a lot of graphs and even use PowerPoint. I know, it's crazy. First, let's start with the general engine management of the Spitfire. While the Spitfire is not completely automated, the aircraft is quite easy to handle. In the standard configuration, you only must control throttle and the RPM. That's it. Radiators, mixture and the supercharger is automated. If you however select the 150 octane fuel loadout option, you need to switch the supercharger stage manually, but more about that later. I guess it's pretty straightforward what happens when you apply more throttle. You get more power out of the engine. More power leads to better performance statistics across the board. You climb faster, airspeed will increase and so on. Now the RPM is a bit more complicated. RPM revolutions per minute describes how often the engine goes through a full cycle per minute. And the engine drives the propeller in the end. The Spitfire has a constant speed propeller, meaning that there is a module in the plane, the propeller pitch governor, which adjusts the propeller pitch to keep RPM constant. The pilot can set a RPM setting, for example 3000 or 2500. If you set a high RPM, the plane will set the blades in a very fine angle, trying to get lots of large bites out of the air at a high rate. This is done to get a lot of thrust used at low speeds or at takeoff for acceleration or climbs. If you set a low RPM, the blades turn out of the slipstream and generate little thrust, meaning acceleration and climb rate is severely hindered, but that does not matter if you are already fast, so you don't need to accelerate, or when acceleration is not a priority. For example, a small reduction of RPM at cruising speed leads only to a minor speed loss and if the Spitfire is really fast beyond maximum speed, like in dives, a reduced RPM setting will lead to a more aerodynamic aircraft. So in short, if you want to climb or accelerate, use higher RPM settings. And if you want to cruise, dive or to keep speed, you should reduce the RPM a little to preserve the engine and to save fuel. Now to conclude this chapter, let's talk a bit about the supercharger. A supercharger is basically a device which is compressing the air and feeding it to the engine. More air to the engine means more oxygen is available for the combustion process, which in turn means more power. In many aircraft the supercharger has either stages or gears or both, meaning the supercharger operation can be adapted to work better at high or low altitudes. The normal 100 octane Spitfire comes with an automated system which switches the supercharger gear automatically at about 14,000 feet. A red light lights up in the cockpit when that happens. You can force the aircraft to stay in the first supercharger gear if by pressing the supercharger gear button, but there aren't many practical cases where this makes sense. However, like fuel consumption is a bit reduced if you use only the first gear at high altitudes. In the 150 octane version of the Spitfire you must switch manually. In my experience in normal operation or at climb or cruise power it also makes sense to switch at 14, 15, 16,000 feet, some, something like this. However, if you want full power it makes sense to switch earlier at 10,000 feet to get maximum power. Don't forget to switch to low gear again when you fly lower than 10,000 feet. Now that we talk about it, there's one misconception I want to clear up at this point here. Some people advise you to switch supercharger gears as soon as the manifold pressure can't be held anymore by the low gear. This is wrong. Switching gears means that more power from the engine is diverted to the supercharger, which at first means a loss of power. That's power used to drive the supercharger and that power can't be used for propulsion anymore. Only if the second supercharger gear can offset this by getting substantially more air to the engine, you get effectively more power again. So if in doubt, switch a bit later as you climb, since you lose performance only gradually, whereas if you switch too early, you have a substantial sudden loss of power. So now this is cleared up, let's talk about the engine regimes of the Spitfire and some fuel economy tips. 
For cruising, so for flights from A to B or some aimless patrols, you want to use cruise power. Cruising power is an official engine regime as per Spitfire manual and it sits at 2650 RPM and 7 pounds of boost and is indefinitely sustainable. Note that you are leaving cruising power when RPM or engine boost is exceeding the mentioned settings. Cruising power gives you, not very surprisingly, good cruising speed at an efficient fuel consumption of roughly 5.6 liters or 1.2 imperial gallons a minute. So if you would fly the entire sortie on the setting, this would give you 68 minutes in the air. The engine automatically operates at a lean mixture at and below 7 pounds of boost. If you go beyond, the Berlin engine will enrich the fuel-air mixture and the consumption increases quite considerably. The next official engine regime is called International Power. International Power sits at 2850 RPM and 12 pounds of boost and is rated for one hour at a time. So basically you can run that setting until you are out of fuel. You should use that setting when in general combat or if you want to climb to an altitude quickly. So for the initial climb out from your airfield for example, or when you are in an area where fighting is going on. It gives you a decent climb rate, decent speed, but is in no way competitive against the Focke-Wulf 190s and bf 109s emergency power. The fuel consumption increases by 27% to 7.1 liters or 1.57 gallons per minute. A full tank would be now emptied after 54 minutes. The last official engine regime is emergency power, 3000 rpm and 18 pounds of boost, all out power. This gives best speed, climb rate and acceleration, but comes at a cost. This is only possible for 5 minutes at a time and will suck the fuel tank dry in no time. The fuel consumption is increased by another 52% compared to international power, 10.82 liters and 2.38 gallons a minute. If your goal is to conserve more fuel than just by using cruising power, you of course can do this. For extreme fuel saving, I recommend to go at or below zero pounds of boost and 2000 RPM. This way you reduce fuel consumption by quite a bit, cutting it almost in half compared to uh, cruising power. You can improve fuel consumption further if you throttle down even more. But of course you cruise then very slowly, but you are still extending your range up to a certain point. I will do some tests after I've done my uh, voiceover. I show you some graphs how this affects um, covered distance. Let's talk about the controversial topic engine timers. If you are an informed regular player of the game, you know what that means. If not, let me explain. I earlier mentioned engine regimes, international power, cruising power and so on. These power settings are official settings which you also can find in the original Spitfire manuals. The manuals also state that the engine regimes are rated for a certain amount of time. 60 minutes for international power and 5 minutes for emergency power for example. Historically these limits were mostly, but not always, in place to lengthen the engine overhaul and replacement time. So to reduce maintenance and logistical effort. Usually a Merlin engine would not cease after 5 minutes of full power. However, the engine would need a check after the pilot lands. The simulation can't reflect this. There is no ground crew. So the devs came up with an arbitrary engine timer model to force the player to keep the limits in mind. If you now exceed the time in the game, there is a very high chance that the engine gets damaged. This gets more and more likely the longer the timer is exceeded. The timer can be recovered by throttling back to continuous power. The Spitfire recovers its emergency power at a 3 to 1 ratio, which means that after using all 5 minutes of emergency power, you need to rest the engine at continuous power for 15 minutes to recover the timer fully. The recovery works gradually. For example, resting the engine for 7.5 minutes recovers half of the 5 minute timer and so on. By the way, lowering the throttle below maximum continuous power is not accelerating the recovery process. 
However, using intermediate power uh, settings in between international and emergency power consumes less of the timer. Meaning that just because you use slightly more power than international power doesn't mean that you have only five minutes. I have tested a bit and used some combination of RPM and throttle settings. I noted that even though five minutes is the official time, I got more time in most of my attempts at full power. Up to 10 minutes even. So for the Spitfire, there's a lot of leeway. With slightly reduced RPM, for example 2950, but maximal throttle, the time until damage increased to 12 minutes until engine damage on average. I've tested three times. I would have liked to test more settings and plotted the time. However, already, like I said, this slight reduction of power led to a 12 minute timer to test all different power settings at even lower RPMs at throttle would have needed a mind-boggling amount of time. So at this point, just take away, throttling down a tiny bit can make quite a difference in engine endurance. So if you are not chased directly and you can afford to throttle down a bit, then you have more than enough engine endurance. But don't hesitate if you need all the power you have, there's also enough time for that. Another thing to note is that if you use the 150 octane version of the Spitfire, you have also 5 minutes of full power at 25 pounds of boost. The time limit is therefore adapted to the new power ratings. 5 minutes for 25 pounds and 60 minutes for 12 pounds. The intermediate settings in between that of course result in a timer somewhere in between. Just for the record, I'm not a big fan of the timers, at least not of the current implementation of them. They, the timers are arbitrary and first and foremost intransparent. A player has no clue in what state the engine is at a particular moment. In one moment the engine is fine and in the other, the, in another moment the engine just stops. There are no vibrations, no RPM fluctuations, nothing. In my opinion, if they use those timers, there has to be ways to tell how the engine is doing. Be it by excessive smoke, engine noises, oil temperatures, etc. Something. Also, some planes suffer more of those timers than others. Especially planes where the engine ratings in the manual are already quite conservative. Like the limits of the P40 for example, which are apparently peacetime ratings. But all this is a topic for another time. In the next video we will talk about the performance of the Spitfire Mark 9 and the loadout options. We will go over some general tips and tricks to get more out of the aircraft. See you in the next one.